Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Daijaku Kinst, and um, I'm a professor here at the Institute of Buddhist Studies. And I'm going to be uh, moderating the venerables that are sitting at the table here. Um, it's a genuine pleasure to welcome you to the Institute of Buddhist Studies and the Mindfulness Three Buddhist Perspectives Symposium. We here are particularly happy to host this event and hear from these esteemed teachers on the topic of mindfulness in their respective Buddhist traditions. Um, as a Buddhist graduate school and seminary, and a part of the Graduate Theological Union. Uh, we here are dedicated to supporting a deep understanding and expression of the Dharma in all of its forms and in a dialogue with the wider culture. So as a community of people committed to the Dharma, we study together, listen to one another, and learn from each other. And our students then take this understanding that they've developed out into the world as scholars and Buddhist ministers and chaplains and teachers. So to have this important topic um, talked about here is, is particularly um, inspiring and relevant to us. We hear much about mindfulness these days in every conceivable venue, as I'm sure many of you can think about all kinds of examples. Uh, I heard about a, a mindful baby carrier recently. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. Um, so to have these three experienced Buddhist teachers presenting their thoughts is a rare and welcome opportunity. And I'm sure we'll learn much, we'll leave with a greater understanding, and we'll probably have a lot more questions than we started with, which is a very good thing, I think. So um, first, I'd like to introduce all the speakers, and then um, Bajan Brahm is going to uh, read from his book. They, they will each speak briefly, and then we'll have a chance to listen in on their dialogue, which is something we're particularly excited to do, uh, their discussion about this together. And then there'll be time for you to ask some questions, um, and then we'll just have a few closing remarks and end the so our first speaker, Ajahn Brahm, is familiar to many of you, I'm sure, through his teaching and wonderful and intriguingly titled book, Who Ordered This Truckload of Dung? Uh, the book ably uh, reaches out to us through story, metaphor, and honest expression of our human experience to inform and inspire and encourage us in the Dharma. His other books, The Art of Disappearing and Mindfulness, Bliss, and Beyond, are equally compelling. So 
So tonight we will hear from his uh, greatest, his latest greatest. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, be grumpy. Uh, and then he will have some um, share some um, of his thoughts about mindfulness in the Theravadan tradition with us. So for those of you that are not familiar with Ajahn Brahm, he has been a monk in the Theravadan tradition for over 30 years. 40? In your little fiber outfits, I I stand corrected, and happily so. So after leaving Great Britain and a life in the academy, he trained with the venerable Ajahn Chah in the jungles of Thailand and is currently abbot of Bodhijana. Bodhijana. Monastery in Western Australia and, as you know, teaches internationally. Um, our second speaker is Jonathan Landlaw, who has led a remarkably rich and impressive life in the Dharma and is a noted author and Dharma teacher in the Tibetan tradition. He began his study of Buddhism in India and Nepal and worked uh, as an English editor in the Bureau of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Primary teachers are Lama Dukta Nyeshe and uh, Lama Zopa Rinpoche and Geshe Darke. Uh, his extensive teaching life includes leading meditation courses in North America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. And his book includes Wisdom Energy, Introduction to Tantra, and as a wonderful gift to us all, Buddhism for Dummies. <laughs> Jonathan will focus his remarks on the importance in Tibetan traditions of becoming aware of the motivations behind our actions. And he'll discuss this in terms of the progressive levels of motivation cultivated in the long rim stages of the path teachings, which culminate in the generation of bodhicitta, the bodhisattva's altruistic heart. Um, our last speaker will be Reverend Dr. Taigen Layton. Uh, he's an accomplished Dharma teacher, Buddhist scholar, and author. He is a Dharma successor in the Soto Zen lineage of Shunryu Suzuki and the teacher at the Ocean <laughs> Ancient Dragon Zen Gate Temple in Chicago. Uh, he also, we're very happy to say, is a longtime faculty member at the Institute of Buddhist Studies. His books include Zen Questions. Zazen Dogen and the Spirit of Creative Inquiry, and Visions of Awakening, Space and Time, Dogen and the Lotus Sutra, and also a volume, uh, Cultivating Empty Field. He's edited and co-translated a number of volumes, including Dogen's Ehe uh, Kowaku, Extensive Record, and Dogen's Pure Standards for the Zen Community. Taigen's going to talk about Zazen, that develops and sustains awareness beyond our ordinary thinking and fosters a beneficial presence in the world. And you'll also discuss uh, the way in which this practice is not aimed at achieving a future experience or understanding, but is a kind of Nenbutsu practice in which the practitioner somat somatically is reminded of the Buddha. And he'll talk a little bit about the implications of this. So uh, I'd like us all to please, uh, please join me in the first speaker, Ajahn Thank you. Thank you. class one evening. Many of her neighbors had been robbed, so she told the guard at the gate to her mansion to be alert and mindful at all times. When she returned, she discovered that her mansion had been robbed. She scolded her guard. I told you to be mindful of burglars. You have failed me. 
but I was a sinful man, replied the guard. I saw the burglars going into your mansion, and I noticed burglar going in, burglar going in. Then I saw them coming out with all your jewelry, and I mildly noted jewelry going out, jewelry going out. Then I saw them going in again, taking out your safe, and I mildly noted again, safe being stolen, safe being stolen. I was mindful then. Obviously, mindfulness is not enough. Had the guard been kind to his employer, as well as mindful, he would have called the police. When we add kindness to mindfulness, we get kindfulness. A few years ago, I had food poisoning. Months of my traditions depend on arms food, offered every day by our lay supporters. We never really know what we are eating, and we often put into our mouths something the stomach later has an argument with. <laughs> An occasional stomachache is an occupational hazard for monks. But this time it was far worse than about to be digestion. This was the agonizing cramps of food poisoning. Instead of the hospital, which a sensible monk would have done, I used kindfulness. I resisted the natural tendency to escape from the pain and felt the sensation as fully as I could. This is mindfulness, experiencing the feeling in the moment as clearly as possible without reacting. Then I added kindness. I opened the door of my heart to the pain, <coughs> respecting it with emotional warmth. The mindfulness provided me with feedback. I noticed that my intestines had relaxed a little because of the kindness, and the pain was slightly less. So I continued with the kindfulness. Little by little, the pain decreased, as the kindness did its job of relaxing the digestive tract. After only 20 minutes, the pain had gone, totally. I was as healthy and relaxed as if the food poisoning had never occurred. True story. That was full on food poisoning. The cramps hurt like hell and made me double up in agony, but it was countered by full on kindfulness. I have no idea what had happened to the bacteria that are the cause of food poisoning, but I didn't worry about that. The pain had gone completely. This is but one personal example of the power of kindfulness. Kindfulness is the cause of relaxation. It brings ease to the body, to the mind, and to the world. Kindfulness allows healing to happen. So don't just be mindful. Be kindful. A little story to add to this. Thomas, not his real name, had spent many months meditating in our monastery in Australia before returning home to his home in Germany to pursue further studies. He told me this story of how kindfulness had made him 20 euros when he really needed it. On Thomas's first day on the campus of a German university, it was Hamburg University, an ATM machine emitted a strange sound as he passed. <laughs> a type of gurgling sound, as he described it. He imagined that the university ATM was welcoming him onto campus. <laughs> From that day on, Thomas repeatedly sent thoughts of kindness to his friend, the ATM, <laughs> whenever he passed it. Something like, may your banknotes never run out. May your customers never hit you when they discover they have no funds. May you never suffer a short circuit, and so on. After, ma <laughs> After many months, Thomas was sitting in the warm sun, having his lunch within a few feet of his friend, the ATM, when he heard the familiar gurgling sound once again. He turned around to see a 20 euro note emerge from the machine. He had been to the ATM 
He had been standing close by to the ATM for at least 15 minutes, and no one, no one had come close to the machine, let alone try to make a withdrawal. So he went to the machine, took the note, and then waved it in the air to see if anyone claimed it. <coughs> no one did. Thomas, the poor student, said, Danke, to his friendly ATM and pocketed the cash. <laughs> the power of kindness. <laughs>
more of the information is registered in your senses. Now, the unexpected thing to me, which later I understand is part of the path of meditation, is what you see, what you feel, what you hear, becomes more and more pleasant, more and more beautiful. In meditation, in my retreats, when we practice mindfulness, we understand that mindfulness is empowered by stillness. The more still you are, the greater the power of your mindfulness. In other words, you feel like you are waking up. You see more, you hear more, you feel more, you smell more deeply. And I'm not going to speak for very long, but the story I'd love to tell, which did not get into any of my books, because it will be banned by wisdom, because it's a bit gross, but it's very funny. <laughs> was one day when I was teaching a meditation retreat, and when you teach, you are also meditating with your students, and I was getting very deep meditation. So my mind was very powerful and very still. And like anybody, I had to go to the toilet to do what we call in Australia. I think it's the same in the United States, a number two. <laughs> yeah, you got it. And when I finished, I made a mistake of looking in the toilet bowl. <laughs> now, when you are very, very mild, <laughs> what you see, you miss in ordinary states of consciousness. <laughs> when I looked at that brown thing in the bottom of the bowl, I'd never ever seen anything so beautiful. <laughs> Just the way those little balls were stuck together, it was like something Michelangelo would have done. <laughs> and if ever you've seen and had a look at you know, the piece of you know, the shit in the bottom of the bowl, you know, there's always a tiny bit of mucus, so it actually, in the water, it actually glistens like a diamond <laughs> in the bottom. And its shape and the colours, not just brown, there were just so many different shades of brown when you had a look at that sort of lovely little piece in the toilet bowl. And I haven't even gone on to the to the the, the odour was just rich and powerful and it just had this incredible beauty to it. And I was looking in there for about five minutes going, wow, <laughs> look at that, that is incredible. I've never seen anything so beautiful and so fragrant in my life before. And I really, this is absolutely true, I really thought of taking it out <laughs> and showing my friends. <laughs> it was only because of my training, you know, I'm a monk, okay, it. I know how to let things go. <laughs> so with a lot of sadness, I pressed the button and watched the most beautiful shit I've ever seen. <laughs> go around the bed. But that is a true story. And that basically I'm not exaggerating, that's how it was. This is what happens when you become very mindful. <laughs> What you see is so much more than normal, normal people see. You empower mindfulness. And it gets like a, like a floodlight. This is a very famous um, little poem by... Um, uh, and then we'll come after I say the poem. You probably all know this. To see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven in a wildflower. To see a blade. Blade, yeah, thanks. To see infinity in your palm of your hand, an eternity in an hour. That's what mindfulness does. You get so powerful with your senses, you can see things which normal people can't. And what you see is incredibly beautiful, which means that when you get into deep meditation, you're incredibly happy, and what you see is what most people miss, the true Dharma. Thank you.
mindfulness that I wanted to address uh, this evening had to do with mindfulness of motivation. What is the influence behind our actions? Uh, and you're probably familiar with a very famous, probably the most famous anthology of Buddhist sayings known as the Dhammapada. And it begins with the so-called twin verses. And the import of the opening verses are that if we speak or act with an impure mind, suffering follows. And if we speak or act with a pure mind, a happiness follows. And this, this is very fundamental to all of the teachings of the Buddha, that the, the mind, the awareness, the understanding, the motivation, leads our experience. And it's the motivation behind our action, which is the main uh, determining factor as to whether those actions are going to bring us what we desire or quite the opposite. So within the Tibetan tradition, there is a, uh, there's something that goes back um, uh, to the teachings of the Buddha, but it was put together by an Indian master who came to Tibet about a thousand years ago. And he wrote the prototype of the so-called Lam Rim text. That simply means the stages of the path. This great teacher, Atisha, studied with uh, over uh, 150 different gurus from around the Buddhist world that he had access to at that time. And he realized that all of the Buddhist teachings were meant to be taken as personal advice on how we live our life. So he organized the teachings in terms of these stages of, of motivation. Now, before we enter into what we might call a spiritual path, whether it be Buddhist or non-Buddhist, something that has to do with really understanding the nature of the mind. Before that, it's typical for us to be, um, in a sense, on a scavenger hunt in this life, trying to gather as many uh, delightful experiences, avoid as many painful experiences as possible. It's like this movie, I didn't see it, but I heard about it, The Bucket List, The Things You Want to Do Before You Die. Well, that's the scavenger hunt that many people are on. And so they travel around the world and have all these different experiences, trying to build up a list of pleasurable things. Um, uh, maybe with the idea that uh, at the end of their life, they can show it to St. Peter, and that will get them into heaven. <laughs> but no matter how many pleasurable experiences we have, or how many painful experiences we try to avoid, that strategy never really works. It never brings the, the longed-for satisfaction. And in the process of gathering what we like and getting rid of what we don't like, it's very, very easy for the impure minds of grasping attachment on one hand and hostility or aversion on the other to arise in the mind. And as the Buddha said, actions done with those kinds of motivation, of, of grasping desires, attachment of those things that we, are, that we like, and hateful aversion for those things that we don't like, uh, that's impure motivation always leads to unhappiness. So the spiritual path can be said to start when we get fed up, when we recognize that what we've been on is a rat race, that even though the outward circumstances of our life may change, as long as our mind is the same, we find ourselves experiencing the same difficulty again and again. And so, uh, this is thrown into sharp relief, especially when we have what we might call a death or a near-death experience. Many people, whether they come from a spiritual background or not, when they go through an experience like this, either the death of a loved one or their own near-death experience, they start to take stock in their life. Well, what would happen if I were to die now? I've got this partially filled out bucket list, but what else? You know, my mind is still out of control. So at that point, either a person then 
uh, becomes addicted to some kind of substance and lives in despair and tries to medicate the pain away, or if they're fortunate, they find a path, a way to make sense out of the mind, and to un begin to understand the nature of impermanence and death, and to find a refuge something, a safe direction in their life by uh, trying to wean themselves away from those actions motivated by those so-called delusions or afflictions. The ones that I've mentioned, and also all these subsidiary ones, such as jealousy and arrogance and the like. Because from these delusions, from these impure states of mind, Impure actions follow, and uh, through the workings of cause and effect, uh, we create harm, and then harm comes back to us. Um, as, as the saying goes, what goes around comes around. So at the initial level of spiritual motivation, from the point of view of these modern teachings, it's our wish to avoid the suffering, the personal suffering that comes from having such an out of control mind, that's our motivation. And so we set a guard on our senses in the sense of trying to avoid those negative, harmful actions, uh, which would then eventually will lead to our experience of suffering and dissatisfaction. And if we are uh, careful, if we're mindful about our behavior, we can cut down on these harmful actions and avoid a lot of suffering. So this, in brief, is the initial level of a spiritual motivation, trying to get our act together. But even though we may be pretty successful in doing that, the root cause of where these delusions, these afflictions came from, those same motives which caused the harmful uh, actions in the first place, the root cause has not been dealt with. There's a, there's a, a story which is told about, by way of analogy, of a person who moves into a, with his family into a new house, and in the backyard there's a tree, a very nice looking tree, but he discovers it produces poisonous fruit. And so being very afraid that this will endanger his family, he uh, plucks all the fruit off the tree, uh, prunes back the branches, and the family is safe for a while. Because as long as the tree is still alive, sooner or later the branches and leaves will regenerate, the fruit will be produced, more fruit will poisonous fruit will be produced, and the danger is back again. So if the person is really interested in gaining complete freedom, you could say liberation from this, uh, this harmful situation, this disastrous situation, it's actually necessary to cut through the trunk of the tree to make sure it loses the, the, the ability to produce that poisonous fruit again. So this, by way of analogy, moves to the second level spiritual motivation, recognizing that just ceasing or attempting to cease uh, harmful actions is a little bit like pruning back the tree. It's helpful, but it's only a temporary solution because the root from which all of these delusions and the negative actions that they create come from is a mistaken notion a misunderstanding of the nature of reality based on belief in an image itself which is a pure fiction. So in order to cut through it, just as a, as a person who's chopping down a tree needs a sharp axe and a good aim and strength, so a person who is interested in gaining complete liberation from this unsatisfactory <coughs> situation needs the strength of good moral discipline, the good aim of concentration, and the sharp act, acts of wisdom. understanding uh, the fictitious 
nature of the self we tend to be in. Those three trainings or practice, then it is possible to cut through that root completely and win liberation for oneself. One would, might think, well, that's enough. If it weren't for the fact that our lives and the lives of everyone else are intimately interconnected. And so gaining complete liberation for oneself, well, one's brothers and sisters, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters, and dear friends are still suffering, is just another form of self-centeredness. So at the third level of motivation, a person who's interested in emulating the path of the big-hearted bodhisattva, the person whose aim uh, for the spiritual path itself and all the actions of daily life are uh, enlivened by the motive of bodhicitta, meaning the wish to experience the full flower that's possible, the true Buddha nature within us all, in order to be a match, uh, matchless benefit uh, to others. And so with that kind of motivation, uh, we can bring that into every action. Uh, one of my uh, uh, teachers had various ways of keeping that compassionate bodhicitta motivation alive, such as uh, <coughs> uh, when walking uh, through a doorway, when he opens the doorway, uh, thinking uh, by this means, may I lead all beings to enlightenment. And then when he passes the doorway and closes the door behind, thinking, may this close the door to uh, suffering rebirths. And in this way, even though one is paying very close attention to what one is doing, one is bringing that compassionate motivation into every action. I appreciate very much the last uh, two speakers. Uh, I'm uh, supposed to speak about mindfulness from the point of view of Zen. And uh, so first I have to say that, strictly speaking, uh, mindfulness is not a, a Zen practice. Or, well, many things are called mindfulness now. What I want to talk about is awareness in Zen and uh, approaches to practice of awareness in Zen, which I think, you know, in a way is, is about what mindfulness is getting at too. So I'm specifically speaking from the Japanese Soto Zen tradition as it is expressed in uh, America. And part of the richness of this event is just all of the ranges of uh, different approaches within the, the world of Buddha. Um, I'm going to speak uh, specifically uh, from Soto Zen, referencing a little bit um, uh, Dogen, the 13th century founder of Soto Zen. And I'm going to read a little bit as part of what I'm saying from this, from my most recent Zen questions, Zen Dogen, and the spirit of creative inquiry. So, uh, awareness. So uh, I'm going to talk about Zazen, which is uh, Japanese um, for sitting meditation in a particular practice. And doing this uh, Zazen practice, sitting upright, usually we sit facing the wall, eyes open, aware of our breathing. Uh, this practice, doing this uh, regularly over time, develops and sustains our awareness in various ways. And um, doing this regularly over time fosters a kind of expression of uh, beneficial presence, of a flexible awareness, of sturdy awareness, uh, being present not trying to reach some particular state of being or some particular state of awareness, but actually being able to be present and upright and still within what's happening now. So in, in many ways, what I'm talking about is very much connected to, my, to uh, what's called mindfulness. Um, so I want to tell a story about uh, thinking in Zazen. Um, 
this is, you know, Zen also talks, uses stories a lot. We have this treasury of old stories. This is from the, uh, from the ninth century, and a teacher, a Zen master named Yaoshan, was once sitting very upright and still. And a student asked him, what are you thinking of sitting there so steadfastly? Yaoshan said, I am thinking of not thinking. Or maybe it can be translated, I'm thinking of that which does not think. So, uh, you know, we're all, we all know when we stop and meditate that the mind starts racing. And uh, the point of the practice is not to get rid of thoughts. Uh, you know, you can do that with a lobotomy, but that's not it. Um, so, <laughs> how do you work with thinking and with not thinking? So, uh, Yashan said, I am thinking of not thinking. And the student, who was very good, um, or else he wouldn't remember the story, he said, how do you do that? How do you think of not thinking? Or maybe, how is thinking of that which does not think? And Yashan responded using a different negative. He said, beyond thinking which sometimes is translated as non-thinking. The point of this is, there's a kind of, this has to do with foreground and background. We're used to thinking about the thoughts that are floating around in our consciousness. We have been trained as human beings to have an ego. This is not only a problem in our culture, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. We need to be able to get through the day, pay the rent, take care of our lives. Buddhist practice is not about getting rid of the ego, it's about not getting caught by it. And instead, seeing this background, that Yaoshan referred to as beyond thinking. So there's this shift that happens between foreground and background. And doing this kind of meditation, uh, and being mindful, and being aware of uh, motivation, as John was talking about, one starts to have this sense of this background awareness. Um, so foreground and background have many layers uh, but Zazen offers the actual experience of a deeper awareness. It cannot exactly be called thinking, but it's a kind of awareness, a kind of consciousness. We could call it beyond thinking, thinking that goes beyond our usual thinking, thinking of the beyond, or thinking that is beyond any thinking that does not go beyond. It's a kind of thinking, but not thinking that cuts things up into little pieces. So uh, how do we, a oh, part of this, do we become open to the unknown, and that we not, need not fear that? We, beyond thinking, again, it's a kind of awareness, but it's not thinking and it's not not thinking, or maybe it includes both. Um, but the point of this is we start to develop a very intimate and deep relationship with something that we all share, but which each of us has our own particular relationship with. So how do we develop a deeper kind of awareness? Part of this uh, in Zen practice is a kind of this attitude of inquiry. What's going on? What is this? Whether we're looking at a toilet bowl or looking at a mountainside, what's this? And, 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 a very, and, and not, not a kind of questioning to try and get some answer, but to actually develop our faculty of paying attention. This is, uh, as Yashua said, beyond thinking. It's not that we're thinking about it, although that might happen. It's not that we're getting rid of thoughts, although you know, there's spaces between the thoughts. But what is this awareness that is beyond thinking? So uh, one thing to say is that this practice of sitting upright, this zazen, being present and still, paying attention, breathing, facing the, we usually sit facing the wall or facing the floor in front of us. Uh, it's not some practice to achieve some state or some experience or some understanding in the future. It's just this. Right now. What's happening? How is this? So I feel, maybe some, somebody, some of the rest of you feel warm. It's kind of warm in here. Okay, I'm aware of warmth. It's not that I have to, I mean, thank you for opening the door, but it's, uh, you know, here we are. Um, okay, that's part of the reality that I'm sitting with right now. Um, so, this practice, doing it over a sustained, uh, sustaining a, a regular practice like this, um, it does include a transformative function. We don't sit trying to reach some particular goal or some idea we have of enlightenment or whatever we But, again, paying attention to our experience, we develop a kind of uh, deeper awareness, uh, and 
part of that part of the inquiry is uh, to look at what's important. So this goes back to bodhicitta and, and, and what do we care about. And part of the practice is to be honest about it. What's important to me? And you know, you uh, my teachers, teachers, Suzuki Roshi talked about what is the most important thing. And I would say, okay, what are what are some of the important things? What's important to you? To actually know what you're up to. To actually see, and that part of that is seeing the patterns of trying to grab things or get rid of things, our fear, our frustration, our anger. To get to know that, to, to actually study the self, to, study the self, to become intimate with our own uh, patterns of reacting. And when we do that, we don't need to. We have a chance, more of a chance of other options of not reacting according to our habits of grasping or aversion, but to actually just be present, pay attention. What is this? What's important to me in this situation? Um, so it's not a matter of figuring something out. It's a matter of being fully present. But also it's open to this um, interconnectedness that John mentioned. So in, uh, one uh, teaching, I'll just read a little bit of this from Dogen. He says, when one displays the Buddha mudra, with one's whole body and mind, sitting upright in this samadhi or meditation, even for a short time, everything in the entire Dharma world, in the whole phenomenal world, becomes Buddha Mudra. And all space in the entire universe awakens. This is an incredibly radical statement, inconceivable statement. What does it mean for space to awaken? I've been studying the sentence for 40 years. I'm still working with it. <laughs> what does it mean that all space awakens, as, as, as Dogen proclaims, about this simple, very simple sitting practice? Uh, so, uh, again, what's important? And then as we pay attention, we see how we've developed this kind of background sense of our deep interconnectedness, that we're all in this together, that whatever pleasurable experiences or states you might have, if people down the street are suffering or in, or in misery, that's, that affects us. We are connected uh, all around the world. Uh, so um, I want to talk more about this, uh, what he says about displaying the Buddha mudra. So maybe many of you know mudra is uh, a, a physical gesture. So this is a mudra. There are many different kinds of mudras, or hand positions, or physical positions. So this awareness that I'm talking about, beyond thinking, is somatic. It's a, it's a physical awareness. It, it doesn't ignore thinking in the mind, but it's, it's a groundedness. It's sitting on the ground and being present in this situation, on the particular chair you're sitting on now, with the particular people around you. So again, he says, when one displays this Buddha mudra with one's whole body and mind sitting upright in this samadhi, even for a short time, everything in the entire Dharma world becomes Buddha mudra. Our efforts and, it, and engagement and settling into this deeper awareness affects everything around us. And vice versa. He also says, um, let me find a shorter version of this, uh, that, um, that at this time, when we do this, because earth, grasses, and trees, fences, walls, clouds, and pebbles, all things, he mentions fences and walls, so called man made natural events, because uh, they carry out the Buddha work, there before everyone receives this benefit, and all are imperceptibly helped by this wondrous and incomprehensible influence. So, Dogen's style is to proclaim his awareness from his deep experience. This is something we partake of. We may not be able to articulate it, but we have a sense of this deeper awareness and of groundedness in this Buddha awareness. And taking the Buddha mudra, displaying the Buddha mudra wholeheartedly with our whole body and mind, this means sitting like the Buddha. So in our meditation halls, we have a, an image of the Buddha or sometimes the Bodhisattva in the center. And we sit upright. And you know, in our center, we have people sitting in chairs and people kneeling and cross-legged. We're flexible about people's physical limitations, but basically, if you're sitting upright, sitting like Buddha, uh, there's something that happens that is directly related to this idea of mindfulness. Uh, so in Japanese, um, the character for mindfulness, it's used for mindfulness, 
course, in, in which the Chinese character is nan, pronounced nan in Japanese, or nyan in Chinese. Um, I hope I pronounced that correctly. This is also the nan in Nembutsu. So we're sitting here at the Jodo Shinshu Center. It's uh, based on the practice of Dogen's contemporary Shinran, who founded the Pure Land, one of the Pure Land schools in Japan. And their practice called Nembutsu refers to chanting uh, uh, the name of Buddha, in this case, Anamomita Buddha, one of the particular Buddhas. And I would say that sitting upright, displaying Buddha Mudra, sitting upright like Buddha, is a kind of Nambusa practice because we're remembering or reminding ourselves of Buddha. So just reminded of Buddha. And in the middle of a busy day when we're caught up in whatever, overwork or frustration, just to stop and pause and take a breath and remember, oh yeah, Buddha. I was, I was uh, interested in Buddha somehow <laughs> earlier today. What is that? And just to you know, hit the pause button and say, oh yeah, here I am. Um, here we are. Uh, so this, this idea that we are connected this deeply to all of space or all of reality has very profound implications for our relationship to reality, to the environment, to each other, to the world, to social justice, to climate damage, all of the issues that we are beset with. Um, again, how do we express Buddha Mudra in our lives? This is, the, this is the question. This is the kind of awareness that I'm uh, citing as a relationship to mindfulness. And happening, but we don't make any uh, attempt to ameliorate anyone's suffering or bestow upon them any kind of happiness. It's just looking through a, a plate glass window. Okay, it's, uh, it's uh, I would actually say that um, there is intellectual property for 
uh, because many therapists have stolen mindfulness from Buddhism. And in Sanskrit, that the uh, Apple's operating system will be held to pay. So I reckon that mindfulness should be reclaimed by the Buddhists. <laughs> yeah. And as another thing, because I love to stir things up, the worst thing of coming to a talk is when everybody agrees with each other. <laughs> So, uh, as a uh, Buddhist, uh, I don't adhere to any particular tradition, but I really do object to the idea of interconnectedness. That is not part of the Buddhism I understand. And to, prof to prove the point, we are no longer connected with our microphones. <laughs> so I would actually say that the world is just like your iPhones. They can be connected, but thank goodness they can be turned off. Otherwise, we would have no peace whatsoever. So just put that out there, because sometimes assumptions which we all say in Buddhism, they say it's all interconnected. I really want to challenge those assumptions, so we don't just take it on face value and believe it, yeah, it's interconnected. Is it? Why is it? Are you sure? <laughs> okay. Well, I mentioned interconnectedness, so I'll respond. But I want to say something else. Uh, uh, and John can go can go after him because he, he did it. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's I think part of the practice is questioning everything. So good, thank you. Uh, but you know, I want to add to what John said that the point of the Buddha way of the Dharma is. Awakening, liberation, and relieving suffering. So, in, in that, that, that ethical aspect is, has to be part of it. Uh, it's not just, it, as you said, it's not just mindfulness, it's kindfulness. So, how do we be kind? Um, yeah, of course, sometimes we don't feel interconnected, or we, speak, or we can see separation. There's separation, of course, as well. Uh, and, I'm, and from the point of view of ultimate, of the ultimate awareness, yeah, I think we are connected. But how we're connected might be in disagreement. Um, how we're connected, there's the whole chain of causation, and we can, we can look at that uh, theoretically, what different levels of causation and dependent co-arising of things. Um, but I would say we are related. That emptiness is about our internal emptiness. Anyway, uh, we, could, we, could, we could go back and forth. John, want to throw something in? Well, I guess that word interconnected could be used in a lot of different contexts. And the context in which it makes the most sense to me is the fact that the, the heart isn't complete until it's open. You know, the closed heart, one that's hiding behind walls, is is not a true heart. It's not a functioning heart. It's not really beating. But when it opens to others, then it is, then it exists, then it functions, and then it's, it brings something beyond beyond ordinary happiness. It brings joy, it brings benefit. And so that open-heartedness, to me, is a sign of a type of interconnectedness that exists. Now, does everyone recognize that? Uh, I think it's one of the great aims of all the various spiritual paths that have ever been, have ever been promulgated in, in this world, all the valid, uh, excellent ones, is to help train to open the heart and sense and experience that interconnectedness. Because we can wall ourselves off, but that doesn't negate the fundamental interconnectedness that we can all tune into. Yes. <laughs> I, I think another simile may, um, again, open up uh, the idea in, a, in a, another way. It's the open-heartedness of a doctor, a surgeon, you know, who does uh, work so hard to help other people, to heal other people. But there comes a time in all doctors' lives when they retire. And when they retire, they don't do any more surgery. But in that time when they were practicing as a doctor, they have trained 
as I have assisted, inspired so many other doctors who will carry on when they pass away. So yeah, that happiness and compassion is an essential part of the path, but not the end. I like a path with an end, not a path which goes on and 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 on. And, on and, on. <laughs> and the end has to be the heart vanishing with everything else. Well, I'll disagree with you. So, of course, there's an end to this personal life, to all of us, and facing death is one of the one of the best ways to invigorate our own lives, to realize that there's an end to the particular person sitting on on each of our chairs, but. Um, I would say this practice is not just about personal liberation, that, that uh, again, you can develop various meditative awarenesses yourself, but if the people are, if, you know, when the patients come to you, if you're the, if you're the surgeon or whatever, you see that they're still suffering out there. Um, so there has to be a balance about it. Uh, uh, in our tradition, we talk about uh, and Dogen talked about Buddha going beyond Buddha, or ongoing awakening. So when, when Shakyamuni had his great enlightenment, he didn't go home and watch television, or, or you know, he, he, he went out and he, and he shared that with other people. So, uh, and, and he continued sitting every day, and he continued awakening, I would say. So mm -hmm. awakening is something that has to happen again and again and again in each new situation. How do we see what's going on with the person in front of us? How do we awaken to what is there and what we can share and what we can learn from each person? So awakening isn't just a one-time experience. It's ongoing. And in that sense, yes, as you said, it, uh, there we have lineages of teachers and of, of people who've inspired us, who've allowed us to be uh, sharing the Dharma. And this goes on and on and on. And so it goes on and on individually, and it goes on and on collectively in the Buddha way in, in all the different traditions. So in that sense, um, yeah, we have individual ends, but um, the work of caring about the world and caring about what's happening and of trying to trying to relieve suffering that goes on. You pass on the baton that everybody is supposed to finish the race. So let's admit I disagree with Sydney, especially in the Theravada tradition, as to say that there is a continual awakening of a Buddha of an enlightened being. Once that awakening has happened, it's permanent, fixed, there's a lot of work to be done to share that with others. But that's you know, what you know, the Pali tradition is the first nirvana, and the second nirvana is the Pari nirvana. Sure. And the Pari nirvana literally means in Pali, there's Pali experts over there, is complete, full, cessation, gone, finish. So that's where the Buddha has done his job, finish it. It doesn't go on anywhere. It's not annihilating. It wasn't there in the first place. Well, so it's a process. Go, finish. Go, no more. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because what I'm Go hearing on. is very distinct differences. Yes, why not? Which I find exciting is because how we model a discussion with distinct differences is a very important ethical model. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I'd like to hear is. How do you then dialogue, or do you, when some of the dominant themes of mindfulness is going on in the world? What, what is that dialogue? What is that difference? Huh? I don't understand the question. What do we have to do? Okay. So each of you is describing a certain vision, okay. a certain path. And we're hearing some of the differences as well as the similarities. But part of what we're talking about when we're talking about mindfulness is that there is this uh, way in which mindfulness is being described in the popular culture. And um, I'm curious about, and perhaps other people are curious about, how do you um, dialogue with that? Do you? Do you want to have? Do you care about what's going on? You know, you said 
intellectual property theft. <laughs> I think it's a great phrase. Like, what is the relationship between the visions that you're sharing with us about mindfulness and what's happening in popular culture? Okay, well, it was last October, I was the uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. I was going to uh, another disciple's uh, request to teach there at Dalhousie. And that's also the, the place where uh, Buddha Dhamma has his head offices. And I was uh, interested that they've uh, introduced a new magazine called Mindful. And they've introduced that because uh, they want, they were told by uh, the leaders of the mindfulness movement, people like John Kevin, that they are a bit embarrassed that they've taken Buddhism out of mindfulness in order to spread it into a basically, a, a, a mostly a Christian country, the United States, without it being rejected by the very heavy Christian And now they want to try and reclaim it for Buddhism. And so it was a John Cabot Zinn's recommendation, so I was told by the editor of Buddha Dharma, I can reintroduce you know, Buddhism, you know, of all the three different types, 40 the time, how many different types there are, back into mindfulness. So there is a movement coming from the very founders of mindfulness to reintroduce some other dharmas into the mindfulness. I think that's a wonderful thing which we have. I agree. John, you were mentioning in your part that there comes a point in somebody's life, you know, kind of getting their act together, starting to be mindful of the motivation behind their actions. 
and then it's steering a better course. And then after you, you said that, you said uh, there was a particular way that people keep themselves motivated to stay on the path. I'm not sure I understood or heard it right, so I was wondering if you could tell me what it was again. Yeah. Well, uh, at initial stages, there is smoke impermanence. This, this, this fact, this reality, becomes torn out of that mind very strongly. Then, uh, thinking that, knowing that, then it allows us to uh, have a much better view as to the worth of any particular action we're doing. Uh, like, like, for example, if we're, uh, uh, if we're getting really angry at someone for some perceived slight, We're, we're, we're turning that other person into a true villain and herself as a true self-existent victim of his villains. But if we realize that in a little while both of us are going to be dead, right? it really takes the rug out from under that grasping on, that, on the, the role that we project out there and out to ourselves. We can think this, this too will pass. We can uh, step back a bit. Not, we're not ignoring everything, but just step back from the involvement in this narrative that we're creating. You know, this constant script that we're writing. We're here, casting ourselves sometimes as the villain, sometimes as the hero, sometimes this, sometimes <coughs> that. Um, and so, impermanence and death meditation helps very, very much on that. And then, uh, but at different points, in that practice, different things ground us in this awareness. And uh, so, for example, skipping to that so-called third level of motivation is, and pardon me for using the word interconnectedness, because <laughs> the fact that our life is uh, intimately interconnected. You know, just the, you eat a spoonful of rice, get it to the tip of your spoon to go into your mouth. You know, it, it's the concerted effort of hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of beings went into bringing it there. And that's just one spoonful of rice. And so all of these kinds of awarenesses, impermanence, the fictitious nature of the self that we're grasping onto, that's not to say that we don't exist, but the, the self that's up there on the thought balloon, up there in cloud cuckoo land, you know, writing this constant script, uh, that's, that's a vicious creation. And then at the, uh, beyond that, uh, understanding that heart connection. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure I've touched on exactly what you're asking. I guess I'm not a huge person, so I pay attention to it. Um, um, when you become aware of the suffering in others, especially those who suffer a life of drug, drug abuse and drug addiction, what would the process of applying kindfulness to alleviate their suffering look like? Okay, obviously a very, very big question. And one of the reasons of drug abuse is not being um, respected, not being welcomed. And you know, it is very true there's many people who have had uh, incidences of drug abuse. Uh, one of the reasons that they keep on doing the that is because of the guilt, the lack of self-esteem, the lack of nobody likes them, the self-destructiveness. So the kindfulness is actually to obviously to embrace that person and not to sort of demean them because of who they are or what they're doing because it stigmatizes a person. They're called a drug addict, not a person who at this moment seems to be stuck on drugs. But they're much bigger than that. And sometimes pointing out to anybody who has schizophrenia, who is a murderer, who is a terrorist, that there is no such thing exists in this planet. There are no terrorists in this world. There are people who do terrorist acts. There's no such thing as schizophrenics. There's people who 
about episodes of schizophrenia. There is no such thing as a drug addict. There is a person who is in this time, in this situation, is taking far too much drugs, and they have an addiction to it, but that's not who they are at home. Pointing out the other part of the person is getting them to be mindful of the other part of them and to be kind to them. Short answer to a big problem. It's probably not. <laughs> I have one question. I'm sorry. Um, whenever the word mindfulness or being present, you know, that we hear all the time, comes to my mind, the little voice asks, well, what about the future? You know, we were taught all our lives that, well, think about your future, blah, 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 blah. But as soon as I try to remind myself, be mindful, be here, be present, and then all of a sudden the question arises, well, what about the future? Good question. Uh, mindfulness is, and being present is not only about this narrow view of the present. Everything in the past and future is here, now. Everybody you've ever met is part of that question. So to be fully present is to acknowledge, to inhabit, to re-inhabit time, to actually uh, include the uh, people walking by in the street outside 50 and 500 years from now, hopefully. Um, how to, so what we do now has an impact. This is basic cause and effect, basic uh, law of karma. And so our, our practice now, whatever that is, will have an impact. So we are connected, again, excuse me, connected. We're not, <laughs> we're not separate from future beings. We're not separate from past beings. But to our mind, I mean, if you're talking about interconnection or connectedness, yeah, you cannot have an object or you, this whole room and all the people in it would not exist if my mind did not exist, right? So if you don't have the mind to perceive you all and all this around, then there's no, none, nothing exists. We're not because, talking about getting rid of mind. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, do, do a input on the connectedness of all the people. I think everything is connected with, a, with that individual's mind because it's almost as if it's a projection of my mind, what is out there, because nothing is really external, I mean, reality, an ultimate reality. But it's also the projection of everybody else in the room. Right, so we're all on this together. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so actually, this is a question for any or all of you. I'm, I'm interested in um, your thoughts about the role of relationships in mindfulness. And the reason that I'm asking is because, you know, we've come back to this theme of connectedness or interconnectedness. And so um, that leads me to think that um, that we need other people, we, we need um, feedback from other people to really have awareness about ourselves and, and particularly our own motivations. Um, and I guess when I think about uh, the, the popular culture version of mindfulness, I guess it, it seems to me like it's um, like it's often taught as it's as kind of an individual private act um, that's taken out of the context of uh, traditional communities or student-teacher relationships that are part of the uh, process of practicing mindfulness in Buddhism. Um, so that, that seems to me like one Thing to do is not to change people, not to 
but to care. So to care, the one in front of you is the most important, the most important thing to do. The most important time is now. So I've been practicing that in meditation in life. You uh, um, are the most important person in the world to me right now, which means I'm aware and mindful of you know, how you're looking at me, how you're moving your head to get some feedback, whether I'm hitting the spot and just smile. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, because you're the most important person, that's why I get in a relationship. But as much time in my life as a month where I just close my eyes, I sit in my cave where I live in Australia, where I'm on an aircraft and I put some shades on uh, to actually to meditate. And then the most important person in the world is me, because that's the one I'm with. So there's always somebody with you. It's like there are a lot of people, it's like the person sitting next to you, it's like Sovana, John, he's the most important person in the world to me now. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also it's the same thing. That's mindfulness. That's how hard I understand it. Together with the care. <coughs> Whatever is in front of you right now, if you're driving the car, the traffic is the most important thing. You're not watching your breath or doing some chanting. So whatever is right in front of you is the most important thing in the world. Which means that relationships means I don't know how many times this will happen to you with your partner. If you want to speak to them and they're not listening, you feel you're not important. That really hurts relationships. And the same when you're by yourself. You give yourself that importance when there's no one else around. You care for yourself. <laughs> Making the relationship with yourself and with others. I can't see any difference. Thank you all. Instead of what you're just saying is, so people do you care about others? That doesn't mean that you have some connectedness. No, because I disconnect every time. No, I know. There's too okay. many people. Okay, but my question is, okay, when you just uh, uh, searching for your nibbana, that's a really, you're just, uh, uh, you think you are the most important person, you want to just go to with nibbana. But you come out in the public, and doing this, I really think that that is, that we have interconnection. You don't search for Nirvana. You stop searching. You stop doing that's stuff. Not, that's not my point. Like, <laughs> <laughs> when you are in the public, that means that you uh, acknowledge there is no connection. Oh, because you care about others. Of course I care about others, but not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are beyond caring. <laughs> when I water a garden, no some flowers are dead. It's a waste of time watering them. So I water those flowers, you know, which my limited supply of water, and there's not much water in California in the flat. <laughs> you have to use it where it can make the most impact. So I have to, I have to disconnect from many people so that I can connect with some others. And then I disconnect from that. But the most important thing is that you can disconnect totally. That's the whole idea of how you are. That's what it's called, it's called it Just to get off the real estate side. Does it matter just how much you want to help other people on the real estate side to make some sort of a wonderful place? <laughs> you to get off. This world is a prison. <laughs> when we all go around just tidying up other people's prison cells, Marrying other inmates, having lots of children, <laughs> getting sent centers, Theravada centers, retreat centers into prison, making prison a wonderful place. <laughs> and we realize we should be escaping from this prison. And people say, you monks, or especially someone like me, you're just into escapism. I say, yes. <laughs> when some people call me like they do in the United States a loser, I say, yes. <laughs> the whole idea of being a Buddhist is being a loser. Losing our attachments, losing <laughs> all these ideas. Yeah. I always say the Buddha was the biggest loser. <laughs> 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 Thank you.
I think, I think no. no. <laughs> if you have a book, we can get them signed, but the bookshop's closed now. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you all very much for coming. It's been a wonderful day.